This is the story of my great, great, great grandparents, Marianne and Thomas McClintock. You probably haven't heard of them, but these two devout Quakers played a leading role in starting the women's rights movement. Before the Civil War, law, religion, and tradition combined to severely limit the opportunities available to women. They couldn't vote, hold office, or attend college. They didn't speak in public and couldn't earn a living other than as a teacher, seamstress, or domestic. Married women couldn't divorce an abusive husband, gain custody of her children, or own property, even the clothes she wore. Legally, Wives were owned by their husbands. In July 1848, a small group of reform-minded women met in the McClintock's house in Waterloo, New York, and decided that these wrongs should be made into rights. Marianne McClintock, her two daughters, Elizabeth and Mary, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton sat around a table in the McClintock's house to finish planning the first ever Women's Rights Convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a young mother from nearby Seneca Falls who had become severely disenchanted with the inferior position of women in society. For her, this would be the beginning of a lifetime struggle for women's rights. That day at the McClintock's house, they completed a manifesto for women's rights that they called the Declaration of Sentiments. Patterned after the Declaration of Independence, the document was crafted to remind the world that the promise of the American Revolution had not yet been extended to women. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. The McClintock women and Stanton included in the document a series of formal grievances against men, denouncing inequalities in property rights education, employment, religion, marriage and family, and voting. They knew that their demand for the women's right to vote was so radical that many of their friends would not support it. With the Declaration of Sentiments completed, Elizabeth Cady Stanton left the McClintock's house to return to her home four miles away. The women were hoping for a good turnout at this first ever convention that would be held three days later at the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls, a small village next to the Seneca River. They had placed an announcement in the local paper the week before, and they had invited their friends. Lucretia Mott would be at the convention and was scheduled to speak. She was, at the time, a well-known abolitionist. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist and another friend of the McClintock's, also planned to attend. His letter to the McClintock's accepting their invitation had been passed down to my grandmother and was donated by my family to the National Park Service in the mid-1990s. Abolitionists like Lucretia Mott and Frederick Douglass were strong supporters of women's rights. Their belief in justice extended to all citizens, black and white, male and female. The McClintocks were also deeply committed to the abolitionist cause. Thomas was a founding member of the American Anti-Slavery Society and was the first secretary of the Free Produce Society an organization that advocated boycotting goods made by slave labor. The McClintocks provided room and board in their two-story brick home to two black teenagers. Many believe that their home was a station for runaway slaves on the Underground Railroad.
300 people attended the convention on July 19th and 20th, 1848, arriving on foot and by horse and buggy. The McClintocks, who had played a large role in organizing the event, were guiding forces throughout the two-day meeting. Marianne McClintock was appointed secretary for the convention. Elizabeth, the eldest daughter, gave a short speech on the first day. Mary, another daughter who took part in the writing of the Declaration of Sentiments, delivered what a newspaper said was a short but impressive address, calling upon woman to arouse from her lethargy and be true to herself and her God. Thomas and Frederick Douglass were the only men to deliver speeches. 68 women and 32 men signed the Declaration of Sentiments, which had been written by the McClintocks and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Many at the convention were afraid to put their signature on such a radical document. After the convention, they were ridiculed and dismissed by their neighbors and in many of the newspapers. Typical of many accounts was this from a Syracuse paper. We need not say that we think the movement is excessively silly. Ignoring resistance, these early women's rights advocates pressed on after the convention, organizing petitions and additional meetings. It would be another 72 years until women gained the right to vote, but the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls provided the spark that ignited the beginning of a cultural revolution. In 1998, the 150th anniversary of the first Women's Rights Convention was celebrated in Seneca Falls. First Lady Hillary Clinton spoke at the McClintock's house and said, all of us who are girls and women owe a debt of gratitude to those courageous women who met in this house. My daughter, then six years old, was also at the celebration proudly wearing a badge which noted her relationship to the McClintocks and posing for a picture next to the bronze statue of Thomas. She toured what is left of the Wesleyan Chapel, which is now part of the Women's Rights National Historical Park. And she toured the restored McClintock House, which also is part of the park. Now as I watch my daughter play field hockey, I think about the progress that's been made. I know that my ancestors would be proud of her and would be pleased that she has opportunities few high school girls in the early 1800s could have dreamed of. As abolitionists and women's rights advocates, the McClintocks would be especially pleased that a man of African descent and a woman are running for president. As reform Quakers, I know that if they were alive today, they would still be working tirelessly against injustice in the world. For as Thomas once said, I was trained to obey the monitions of the spirit and be true to my best light. I must speak the truth and abide the consequences.